one, two, three. Are you ready? Ready for I'm this? Ready. That's <laughs> awesome. Welcome, Tara. Thank you All for right. giving time. Too much, too much coffee, Dara. We're oh, ready. Oh, Keith had too much I, coffee. Yes. A lot of coffee. I Maybe left two hours, so I have like seven yeah. already. Of course, of course. So I just want to make sure I can share my screen. Sure, you should be able to. Uh, so okay. you, uh, on the very bottom, if you touch, uh, you got it. All right. Um, I think that's good, right? I think so. Yeah. All right, let me get to the let me get to the beginning. So I just want to make sure that this is what you're seeing. Yep. Got it. Okay. So. Um, are we all ready to rock and roll? You guys are more than halfway there. Oh yeah, we passed the halfway mark already. Um, yeah, we're running Great. about 25 minutes behind our schedule, but okay. it's okay. Okay, well, being a runner myself, I know, I know how important it is to uh, maintain a pace and then also visualize like the finish line, so I will do my best to stay on time. Javier, if you could just kind of give me, you know, the 10 minute warning that will, will be really helpful for me because then I can see where I am in my presentation. Beautiful, um, no problem, thank you. Yes, yeah, so I'm gonna do my very best because there's, it's, this is, um, I'm sure you can gather from everybody who's been speaking, you know, um, we're literally scratching the surface in the areas that we are passionate about. And, um, for certain, I am really grateful to both of you for inviting me to be part of this occlusion marathon. So thank you. This is like spectacular. I, you know, hats off to both of you um, for collaborating and putting this all together. And um, I think the the goal of my presentation is to do the very best I can, highlighting a lot of what I spoke about um, during my interview, which is the lips, teeth, and tongue to toe approach to orthodontics. And then show you one of my patients who underwent that um, transformation, share his story. And I think the most important message is that every one of us agree that we need a team to be able to accomplish this. We can't do this alone. So thank you. Thank you. All right, so what is the lips, teeth, and tongue to toe approach to orthodontics? Um, here's a summary. And this photograph was actually taken by um, Dr. McClendon, this is my youngest son when he was maybe nine or 10 months old. And, you know, this is the picture that represents just innately how we're connected, you know, from our lips down to our toes. Um, I think Dr. Roccobato and everybody in the group has really um, reinforced that message that, you know, you can't think segmentally. Um, what's really important about this interdisciplinary way of treating our patients is that we have to evaluate uh, the whole person. It has to be systems-based, it can't be segmental. And I think the most important thing is to always ask the question why. I think in medicine and dentistry, we get really caught up with being very reactive. We see something like a filling or a cracked tooth and we're quick to come up with a technique or a solution, but very rarely do we take a step back and ask what happened, why is it happening? So, you know, that led me to being more integrative and interdisciplinary for different reasons, because like all of us, we were treated, we were trained traditionally. Um, and we thought in terms of restoration as being one tooth at a time, or if you did more comprehensive treatment, maybe you did a three unit bridge, or maybe you did dentures. But most of what we do is really restorative and transformative. And if we're going to do that, we really have to understand that we need to understand the patient's biology, physiology, and then more importantly, recognize that we cannot do it alone. You know, what we do to the teeth has an impact on the lower half of the body. And then I've really come to appreciate that anything that's out of alignment from the C-spine down can impact my ability to achieve my treatment goals. So this is my patient, Nick, and you will, um, um, see his story a little bit later on, but the reason why I chose him was because Nick had already gone through two rounds of orthodontic treatment as a child. And then he came to me because he was a sibling of one of my patients, um, had moved to the area, and he had noted that he felt his bite was changing. It was just not the same. 
I want you to see this transformation because one of the things we have to ask ourselves is why? What was it about Nick's early treatment and the attempts made by his previous orthodontist, what was it that maybe wasn't addressed? Um, the biggest change you can see, obviously, is the change in the occlusion, but pay attention to his head neck posture. Look at the seal of his lips. Look at how relaxed things are after treatment. Look at his smile before and after treatment. Um, you know, his journey was not a straightforward process. It required a team. So for me, successful interdisciplinary treatment is only possible if you have really well-defined goals, you have to start with an accurate diagnosis. I think everybody in the audience would agree. It's really important to have a clear vision and model, not only for the way the teeth should fit and function, but also for the face, for the airway, and for the bite. And for me, the bite includes not only the, the fit of the teeth and whether it's a, a dynamic chewing system, but also the orthopedic relationships at the level of the condyles and then at the level of the C-spine, which then means the posture. And posture to me also includes breathing because posture is only going to be as good as the ability for the person to breathe through their nose, to place their tongue on the roof of their mouth, and then more importantly, have the proper diaphragmatic breathing that's necessary to keep the body in neutral. You have to have good systems that are well-defined and protocols for diagnosis and treatment. For certain, we need to have a process because the patient's have to go through a process and, and they want to know what's my process, how long is it going to take, how much is it going to cost. So sequence of care is really important. I find that one of the biggest challenges, especially since most of my team members are not in Vermont, I ha I'm, I'm fortunate that I have my um, integrative providers in Vermont, but I work with Jeff McClendon. He's in New York City. I'm in Burlington, Vermont. And then my surgeon for more, for more of my comprehensive cases is Dr. Mike Gunson, and he's out in Santa Barbara, California. So what we have to do is we have to create accountability for each other and also for the patient. We obviously have to be committed. And I think it's really important to recognize that we have to set realistic expectations from the beginning and remind the patient along the way what the expectations are so that they're not disappointed and they don't become this disgruntled patient. And then more importantly, we're not hard on ourselves. Obviously, we all agree it needs to be complete and comprehensive. We're not limited to the teeth. And it has to be biologically stable and predictable. We don't want to do this, you know, and then have it be unstable. So as a lips, teeth to toe orthodontist, I combine uh, all of my training my basic training is I am a Roth Williams, now currently known as Space Functional Clues and Orthodontist. That's my foundation. And then I'm supported by um, um, integrating the bioesthetic dentistry principles. And then in addition to that, I have the training and background as a face airway bite orthodontist as described by Dr. Arnett. I support my interdisciplinary dental facial reconstruction with physical therapy and also integrative and functional medicine as well as adjunctive therapies. And I think when you do any sort of comprehensive treatment, it's really important to recognize that the patient always has to play an active role in their process. If they're not committed to their wellness program, it's all for naught. Um, this is uh, my interpretation of the orthodontic treatment goals. I think you've seen variations within the phase group, but I've modified it a little bit because each petal on this flower scheme represents each of the goals. And what you'll notice is that when you look at a flower, you know, it's complete because each petal is a little different. But, but collectively, when you put the petals together, you see the whole person. And I think what I really want to be able to impart by by talking about this slide is that each petal has value and that not one petal is bigger than the other. And that in order to be really complete and comprehensive, each and every one of these things matter when you are evaluating your patients for comprehensive treatment. And it doesn't matter how old they are. It can be that two or three year old because at the end you have to envision what that two or three year old is going to be like when they're 40 or 50. And then when you have your six-year, seven-year-old patient, you have to remember, okay, what happened that 
brought them to you and why do they have that you know dysfunction or pain that they present with um i think i'm not going to go into depth about this because i think jeff mcclendon will review this in detail but at the end of the day you know it's three basic principles for the biologic model and i'm of the belief that it's really important that when the patient returns to their rest position, meaning maximum manifestation, that the joint is in an orthopedically stable position. We wanna make sure that we have an adequate and distinct amount of overbite and overjet. We wanna make sure that we have proper tooth forms that allow for optimum chewing, but also when we think of chewing, I also think of how important the teeth are for mastication and, not mastication, but breathing and communication and swallowing. And then, and when we are chewing, you know, and I think we have um, a, a range of how we interpret chewing, I think Jeff really said it best, you know, you have to have enough room to be able to chew into your food. So when we talk about vertical chew, the patient's not locked in. So I think we all agree. To be comprehensive, you need a team. And if you have a team, in order to be successful, you need to have all of these things. You need to have a clear vision and common goals. You need to, be able to communicate and listen to each other. Sometimes we don't agree. You need to obviously have training experience. And then when you have the training and experience, you can figure out together how to sequence care, especially when it's long distance. You wanna make sure it's goal-directed. We're synergistic, we collaborate, we have to trust and be committed, but I think the last thing is one of the most important things to really make sure I emphasize about teamwork. You have to have compassion and you have to be patient, not just for the patients, okay, but for each other, because each of us have our own practices. So a lot of times we're really, really busy, but at the end of the day, especially when you have a team that is long distance, you have to be patient with each other. So, <clears throat> I don't have just a dental team. I have a medical team and I have an adjunctive team. And I broke this down so that you can kind of see that this is really an integration of three different you know, categories of healthcare providers and wellness providers. And each of them matter in the patient's process. Um, you know, there is no formula. So a lot of people ask me, hey, what's your system? What's your formula? But you know, everything is customized to the patient. I would say pretty routinely though, you can trust that I am gonna refer a patient to a physical therapist. Just about every single patient is going to have a myofunctional assessment. And then they are going to probably, especially if the patient has a lot of pain and inflammation, they are going to see an integrative physician, a naturopath, an osteopath, somebody who's really going to look at and see whether or not there's a systemic component to their inflammation that, that's causing them pain. The, a lot of the patients come in having um, their adjunctive team in place. So I wanna make a little comment because I think a lot of the complementary alternative medical practices can be just that, but they can also be um, undermining as well. So it's really important to interview the patient, take a complete history, because you may find that some of the symptoms the patients are experiencing or that you can't resolve are because they are seeking treatment that might be competing with what you're trying to achieve. Um, this flow chart was developed by Milt Berkman, who's um, a mentor, and obviously Dr. McClendon mentioned his name earlier, uh, an amazing orthodontist who has retired, and he made this huge contribution. He and Jeff and this other gentleman um, put together this awesome um, diagnosis and treatment flow chart. And it really, looks really complicated and a little overwhelming, but I think the important thing is to break it down into a three-step process. It's diagnosis, visualize, and restoration. And you can just see all the different you know, people that come into play. It looks overwhelming, but for the patients, what we have to do is break it down for them so they can go through the process and feel like they're accomplishing their goals. Um, every single one of my patients Without a doubt, if there is um, any question that they have any sort of approval instability, for certain, any of my TMD patients and any patients who have um, even breathing or sleep issues, pretty much all of them start with an orthotic. So I use this as a way to deprogram the, mus the neuromusculature, seat the condyles, 
And then Jeff already went into detail. I'm not going to explain the shim challenge technique because he did a wonderful job um, reviewing it. But every single one of my patients start with an appliance. And this appliance is in turn supported by the interdisciplinary or alternative adjunctive treatment. So what I have found is when I try to do splint therapy independently, it takes me longer to get the patient into neutral. But if I work with a physical therapist or an integrative physician or any adjunctive therapist who are working towards getting the patient out of their pattern and helping me see that condyle and change the old pattern into a better pattern, then I have found that it's very safe, it's very effective, and it's very efficient. So most of my patients actually go through splint therapy in half the time now. The exception would be for the patient who has any degenerative changes in the joints. Now that's different. In that situation, we take check bites, but we also take scans, CBCT scans, to verify and confirm that the patient is stable enough for us to move forward with their treatment. So the goals of using integrative or supportive therapy is to establish neutral position for the head, neck, and mandible, and tongue. I think um, it's important to strengthen the core and the neuromuscular relationships so that the patient's actually engaging their diaphragm breathing and they're not using their accessory muscles. Obviously, there's pain management. We want to reduce inflammation. And a big part of what we have to do is really ground our patients psychologically and emotionally. So here's a basic checklist that um, I know all of my adjunctive and, and physical therapists and um, integrative physicians use. They basically look at the mechanical and systemic causes. If it's the physical therapist, they're looking at pain and cervical mandibular relationships and neuromuscular skeletal imbalances and patterns. I think nutrition and diet is really important. Travel history, footwear, vision, hearing, everything that you see here needs to also be accounted for when we're doing whole person, teeth to toes, interdisciplinary treatment. So this is the picture of my physical therapist who occasionally have our team weekends. And I just want you to see my patients, when they come in and do any sort of orthotic or occlusal adjustment therapy, they'll get on the floor, they excuse themselves for 15 minutes, and they do their PT. They do their exercises to get their body in neutral. And if I'm doing any sort of, um, you know, occlusal adjustment or additive or subtractive dentistry, they also do their exercises so that I can make sure that their body's in neutral and that I'm in the most predictable, repeatable position. And oftentimes they'll report and they can tell me if something's off. So that's the wonderful thing. These patients are really self-aware. So, um, Javier, how, how much time am I in now? I've lost track. How much time? Yep. How far am I? Ten more minutes. So that's right in time. I'm doing okay. All right. Eleven. So eleven. Okay, I'm gonna do my best. Okay. So this is Nick, and I think um, you know, in this ten minutes that I have, I'm gonna do my very best to take you through his story. So I, I shared with you that Nick had already gone through. Um, previous rounds of orthodontic treatment. And when you look at this patient when he first comes in and then you see the transformation, you just think, you know, what happened? You know, how did, not, not only what happened to get him to this point where he needed to be treatment, but what was, the, what was the process he went through? And I really believe that, you know, Nick would report to you, um, his he is somebody who, if you ask any of my staff, he was very self-aware and he was in my office pretty, frequently letting you know if the splint was out of alignment and he was diligent about doing his physical therapy. But this is his backstory. This is Nick, you know, before he had any orthodontic treatment. I was fortunate enough to be able to um, contact the previous orthodontist and get the initial records and the phase two records. So you look, can see very clearly that he has some crowding, he's got narrow arches, the treatment that they had rendered was phase one treatment with a pile expander, uh, TPA and a lower lingual arch. So this is where he was at the end of phase one. And like most orthodontists, we just monitor our patients, remove teeth, have them come in for growth and development checks until they're ready for the second phase of treatment. 
and this is where Nick was at the beginning of phase two, and this is where he finished. So aesthetically, they're aligned. Um, is this an optimum fit for the uh, for a stable and a functional occlusion? For me, as a as a um, bioaesthetic orthodontist, I, it falls short of the goals. But I think what's more important is to pay attention to the other things that are not tooth related. And you can see, you know, the imbalance in the face. You can see the palate is still really deep and narrow. You can see the lingual frenum. These are all the things that I can see now that I have a different level of experience and, I, and I've opened my eyes up. So here's Nick. My bite keeps changing. I can't chew well and I struggle to bite into my food. And I've already had braces twice. So you can imagine how frustrated he was. This is a close-up view of what his bite looked like in 2010. And because of his age and because of just what I could predict because he was still growing, he was about 16 and a half, 17 at that point. I made the decision, and I'm gonna go through the records very quickly, to put him in a nighttime occlusal orthotic. We actually had to make him a couple over the four years. And the important thing to recognize here is, is to understand why I did that. You know, I didn't wanna jump into treatment, and I know that there are orthodontists out there who probably would say, oh, you could use anchor plates, you could, you could use TADS, you could use Invisalign. But you have to understand that this patient was symptomatic and he'd already gone through two rounds of orthodontics and to his back histories that he also had had a concussion. So there are a lot of different things that you know um, that you have to factor into that shied me away from doing any sort of proactive treatment and I'm grateful that I didn't do um, you know a technique to close his bite but instead I took the time to take a step back and look at him as a person. So this is what his occlusion looks like after having worn an occlusal orthotic. He only wore it at night or when he exercised or when he was ski racing. And then look very closely, you can see he's got uh, an open mouth position. He's got an anterior tongue thrust swallow. These are his um, CBCT, CBCT scans showing his condylar positions and his pan. And um, you know, there has been some um, remodeling and recortication of the, of the condyles and they're relatively centered and in the right position. And these are his managed models and his lateral head film. I'm gonna go through this really quickly. So each of my patients, whether, um, the, again, whether they're six or seven or five or if they're 70, I develop a punch list. And each patient has a problem list, a set of goals and treatment solutions or options that I present to them. And I break it down to dental, skeletal, face, and airway. My integrative physicians, physical therapists, and adjunct therapists, they do the same thing. And they share their problem list and goals and solutions with me. So we presented Nick with um, a bunch of different solutions. He elected to move forward with comprehensive interdisciplinary treatment. And what I want you to be aware of is that all of his treatment was coordinated with physical therapy, exercise, nutrition counseling. And because he was a patient of Dr. Gunson, we also supported his joint health with supplements and joint meds. All right, so I'm gonna go through this very quickly because I know time is of the essence. Um, before sending him to Dr. Gunson, we placed him in a lower occlusal orthotic. And you can see in this orthotic, the beautiful form that was carved into it. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jeffrey McClendon. Um, he made the appliance for him. And what we were doing in this case was, you know, people will ask me, well, he's going to go to jaw surgery. Why are you bothering to, um, you know, stabilize with an occlusal orthotic? Because we want to deprogram the mus musculature, make sure that we seat the condyle so that the oral surgeon can get the most accurate records. Right, because most of what we're trying to do is not just fix the fit of the teeth and the and the jaw relationships, but we also are looking at the soft tissue changes and the postural changes that come along with doing the occlusal orthotic stabilization before surgery. So I'm going through this very quickly. Quickly, these are his pre-surgical mounted models. This, this is the workup that Dr. Gunson did. This is the virtual surgical planning. And here he is three weeks after surgery. And I would say that that's a really nice, you know, uh, really profile and look at the lips. 
even at three weeks. It's pretty impressive. And when you look side by side, look at the changes in his head neck posture. You know, there are studies showing that after, and I think there's one that's um, going to be published very soon, that shows that, you know, immediately after jaw surgery, you can see and you can measure significant postural changes that are favorable. The key thing is making sure that those postural changes last. And that's where physical therapy, even after jaw surgery and after the appropriate amount of healing is important. So obviously one of the goals is to make sure we increase the volume of the airway. Nick didn't have a big airway problem to start with. That was not his chief complaint, but we did see an improvement in his airway. I wanna go through this quickly. The last part is the most important part because if we're going to achieve our goals for stability, we need to take a step back to see what we need to do to improve the chewing, okay? Which also affects smiling, which affects communication and breathing. So Jeff talked about establishing the feline. So Nick was referred back to Jeff. I'm not gonna go through all these images, the key thing is making sure and recognizing that there are form issues and that by recognizing that there are missing tooth forms that have to be placed back to achieve proper balance of the lips, so the buccinator muscles, so that the accessory muscles can turn off, the joints are stable, and the tongue is stable. So Jeff does this test position to see where there are form issues. He takes an impression, takes his caliper, measures from the photos, makes a digital calibration. Thank you, Jeff McClendon, these are his slides. Makes an impression, pours it up, puts a little preview, does a test. See, everything that Jeff does always tests first because you don't wanna start doing dentistry, although composite dentistry is something that you can always add and take away. But when a patient travels from Vermont to New York City, he doesn't have the time or the flexibility of being able to just go down, and get in the car and just go down the road and have his dentistry done. We have to make the most of the visits that the patients make to New York City. So this is um, the additive dentistry and Jeff showing the test positions and how he basically has, nor when I say normalized, he's restored proper for chewing with the three principles. I'm going quickly, I just wanna show you these photos to show the transformation, the facial changes, the postural changes, the lip changes. I mean, to me, he has more ease in his face. And then I, I dropped that true vertical line so you can see that, you know, he doesn't have a really strong chin. He has a longer face, so it's not like he needs this real masculine looking chin. It's appropriate, it's natural. You should not be able to tell that the patient's had orthognathic surgery. These are the skeletal changes that took place. Going, going as quickly as possible. We're almost to the end. Here are his bite transformations. And then we always test, did we meet our goals, our functional occlusion goals? And this is a quick video. Slide forward and back. Back. Left and right. Right. Back. Open. Close. Open big and wide. And close. Open big and wide. And close. Tap, tap. Tap, tap. Nice. Great. So I want to finish up with this. One of the things that I have come to very much appreciate is the importance of tongue position, tongue function, tongue posture. And I suspect that um, the reason why Nick had instability after two rounds of orthodontics is because there was oral motor dysfunction and tongue posture problems that were never addressed or identified in his first round of orthodontics. And even going through and doing, you know, um, splint therapy, um, orthodontics, corrective jaw surgery, the last thing that we had to do and we identified was the need to address his tongue restriction. 
So he did have a lingual phrenectomy completed. And one of the things he absolutely reported was that it was much easier for him to keep his lips together and at rest and keep his tongue to the roof of his mouth. It really helped downregulate a lot of the muscles that were still slightly symptomatic. So, you know, all these little things matter and you do your very best to, you know, make an impact on, on your patients. And, you know, every patient that I treat, I learn from. And I try to do better because I see better because I know more. And I have all of you to thank for that because you guys are all inspirations. All right, um, I just wanna put, put a word in for an upcoming airway symposium that may or may not take place in November. And if you are looking to kind of um, see an amazing team of speakers who um, really kind of embody all these principles that I have integrated into my patients, try to make it to this space meeting. Yes, absolutely. And this I'm is my contact information. Yeah, no, no. this is my, um, my contact I have the, information. 